and we're back. Uh, welcome back, everyone, to ReadZ Live, ReadZ's ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing uh, to show you how to write and publish better books. Uh, today, we've got a very special one. Uh, it's more on the traditional publishing side, uh, which is, I guess, you know, it's a, it's a well we return to every now and again, uh, but it's going to be on hooks. Uh, that thing that captures people's uh, attention you know, reveals a little bit about what your book is about and makes sure that uh, they're desperate to, to want to know more, whether that's a reader, uh, a bookseller, or uh, in a lot of cases, an agent. Uh, we're going to start in just a few minutes, uh, but in the meantime, I see that there's a good chunk of you uh, here already. So uh, I see you're doing already, but let us know where you're, where you're at right now. I see PJ from Florida, uh, Philip from Towster, England. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, James from Rescue, California, fantastic name for a town. Uh, Barbara from Rhode Island, uh, fantastic. Thank you for joining us at a very special time. Uh, it's a little bit earlier for me, so I get to do one of these uh, in the daytime, which is a very rare treat. Um, but, ooh, Cal has asked the hook versus elevator line or elevator pitch. Uh, I guess uh, we could sort of ask those questions later. We're going to bring on our uh, two guests, uh, Rebecca Heyman, who a lot of you will know from her first line frenzies, uh, and Jennifer Uden, uh, who's uh, an editor here at Readsy as well, and a former literary agent. So uh, if there is a distinction between the two, I'm sure they'll be able to tell you. Uh, ooh, Celeste from Moscow, Idaho. Very exciting. Uh, Terry from Bug Tussle, Texas, which I have to assume is the name of a town. Uh, uh, Ahana from India. Welcome. It's good. It's always nice to, that we're able to get people uh, from Asia usually when we do it a little bit earlier because uh, it's now currently only quite late rather than stupidly late. Uh, but it's always great to see folks uh, from a little bit further east. It's uh, My family live in Singapore and Hong Kong, so these are always way too early in the morning for them to tune in for. Uh, but I'm glad to see you're here. We have uh, Tana from Atlanta. Katia from El Salvador, welcome. Uh, I see it's just a, a couple of minutes, but uh, hopefully... Uh, There'll be a few more of you joining. While you're waiting, uh, I would uh, kindly ask you to perhaps like this and subscribe to the channel uh, if you want to learn more about writing and editing and publishing books. Uh, we have a lot of great content uh, coming on the channel every single week, including uh, two new videos done by our uh, video expert, Shaylin. Uh, she's a short story writer, and uh, you may recognize her uh, from a lot of the videos we do here. So subscribe to us and uh, see what we're up to there. Uh, so. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about how we're running this. Uh, I sent around a newsletter to everyone who signed up to the Readsy newsletter earlier this week, asking people to send in the hooks uh, for their book. We gave a, a video to sort of give an idea of what we meant by hooks, and we'll be covering some of that uh, a little bit shortly. We asked you to submit the hooks for any book you might be writing or any book you've written, uh, with the idea that we'll have a look uh, at them right now through the eyes of our uh, editors, uh, who'll be able to see uh, uh, whether they work, whether it's the sort of thing that would work with an agent, with a reader, uh, how it can be improved. Uh, and I'm sure they'll share uh, a few uh, things that all good hooks should have. So hopefully by the end, uh, you'll have a really good idea what a hook is. Um, I see, I think, a lot of people who did send them in, uh, send in something, sent in something that was closer to like a tagline. Uh, so, you know, there's still a lot of confusion, I think, in the world of uh, writing exactly what a hook is. So by the end, let's hope uh, there's no more doubt and we'll all know and uh, be wiser for it. Ah, I see it's now 5 p.m. where I am here in the UK, uh, which means it's midday on the East Coast and about 9 a.m. on the West Coast. Uh, I'm going to bring on our guests. Uh, so please, welcome. Uh, we have Jen and Becca. Jen and Becca, how are you both? Doing well. Doing uh, good. No complaints. Well, uh, seeing as Jen is our new guest here, I'll start with you. Uh, where, are, where are you right now? I am in New York, where I've lived for 12 years, nearly 13 at this point. Not getting the uh, itch to escape the city now, uh, now that everyone seems to be moving uh, back to the rural areas? Oh, uh, well, I, I had that itch scratched because uh, when lockdown happened, when lockdown one happened, I was actually in Houston for a family funeral. So my sister and I just kind of stayed in Houston for six months last year. And that's, I guess, compared to New York, that's what counts for a, a small town. 
Uh, no, actually, Houston is, um, I think it's like the third or fourth largest city in America. Okay. It was nice, though, because my parents' apartment building had a pool. So that was really clutch during the summer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember the last time I've seen a swimming pool. Does that sound weird? <laughs> Anyway, uh, Becca, uh, of course, you are in uh, Massachusetts. I am. I am here. We will establish now for all of the curious onlookers. That is not snow behind me. Uh, it is just a fence. But, um, you know, we're just getting ready for spring here. Still still kind of freezing cold, but we're getting there, and I'm ready to not be trapped inside all the time. I assume the sirens are Brooklyn rather than the rural yes. Massachusetts. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah. No, they're not here. Today, so. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, well, uh, before we get a start on, I know we have like 600 submissions of hooks in here. Uh, we'll get to that quite shortly. Uh, but <laughs> if we just quickly get a bit of background from both of you who might not know you, Jen, uh, what is your, your background in publishing? Sure. Uh, so I have been a freelance editor for a hot minute. Um, Rebecca has been a great mentor and help as I've started that process. But for 10 years, I was a literary agent. I worked uh, a bunch of places, um, Donald Moss Agency, the Barry Goldblatt Agency, and New Leaf Literary. Li Literary. And uh, during that time, I represented lots of wonderful books, uh, a lot of science fiction and fantasy, some award winners, some, some New York Times bestsellers. Not that I'm proud of anything. <laughs> um, but uh, I represented a really wide range of fiction, and it's been fun to be able to keep my hand in as I've as I'm sort of figuring out the next the next steps of my career. Cool. And Becca, for those who uh, who don't know you, uh, what's your deal? I uh, well, I have been um, a freelance editor for a long time, I guess since 2007. So however long has transpired since then. Uh, Jen and I met at the writers conference that I run in New York when the world is not in lockdown. And uh, we just, we connected and we clicked and, um, you know, just doing doing my editing thing and, and trying to, uh, you know, let everybody see how talented my, my friends are. <laughs> So uh, we thought this would be just such a great opportunity to capitalize on Jen's incredible agenting experience. Um, you know, I'm going to quickly work in here that for me anyway, the difference between a hook and an elevator pitch is the medium. Um, you know, uh, an elevator pitch is kind of what you would use if you're talking to someone about your book. And the hook is the written version of that idea that you would use to market your book. Uh, but um, distinctions like that are a lot of the work that we uh, we're doing at the conference. And I feel like, you know, preparing people to move into the public space of authorship is a is just something that, um, you know, we're not talking enough about. So that's where today kind of came from. That's exciting. So I guess before we start cracking on with the uh, reviews of the hooks, Jen, uh, what is what is what is a hook? <laughs> um, well, I think Rebecca summed it up pretty well, but at its basic, at its most basic, a hook is the thing that draws a reader in and makes them want to read more. Sort of like what you said at, at the top of the, at the top of the event. Um, when you, when I think about a hook, I think about um, those sort of old timey theaters with the big hook. And if someone was really doing badly, they just whoosh, you whisk you right off the stage. But in this, in this way, we want you know the story to kind of do the same to a reader in a good way, not in a you're making everything leave the stage way. <laughs> It's, and it's one of those things that it's it, that sounds frustratingly vague, but like pornography, I know it when I see it. <laughs> well, I got to make that joke. I'm so proud. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking speaking of which, I guess uh, might as well uh, see see the first example if we're all good with that. Uh, uh, okay, uh, well, I'm just going to bring this up. It'll probably just take me a second, as always, uh, and then you guys can decide between you who wants who wants to read it out. Uh, just wait. Okay, I'm going to read this one, and then we'll switch off. Um, so, uh, the crown prince of a famished war-torn kingdom is shipped off to marry the princess of a rich neighboring nation in exchange for humanitarian help. The deal has more strings attached than either of them expects. Uh, so I want to I want to preface this by saying that that in a hook where Jen and I are going to be looking to identify three major points 
which is the primary conflict, um, the main characters, and the stakes, which is the stakes are the reason why your readers care about the conflict. So a sort of the, the larger um, personal and or global impact that, that the resolution of the conflict will have on the main character is, is how we sort of get into the meat of the stakes. And so the first thing we're gonna do is try to tick off those three boxes for each of these submissions and then kind of get into more details. We will not be looking at the grammar of these things uh, unless the grammar is distractingly poor. <laughs> so, uh, so, so what do you think, Jen? What do you think of this? Well, I think we have some, we have facets of, of all three of those items or all three of those characteristics that we were looking for, but not in a way that is strong enough. Uh, for instance, is the, is the war tornness the conflict? Is, are the strings the conflict? Is the shipping off the conflict? What's the, what's the, what's the problem here? Cause it sounds like his problems have just been solved, but clearly not. Um, what do you, I mean, yeah, I, can't, and, and I guess we I also can't tell an idea if, of the character, but. Yeah, I can't tell if this is, um, if this is supposed to be a romance setup or if this is something else. Like I can't tell if the primary conflict revolves around the relationship between the prince and the princess in the neighboring uh, nation or if it's the politics of that. Um, and that's a really big deal, right? Because when we have a conflict that revolves closely around whether or not two people can find love, we know we're in a, a romance. But if we have a conflict that revolves around, um, you know, politics and, you know, espionage, that's an entirely different kettle of fish. So I think part of the problem here for me is, is that specificity around the nature of the conflict, but also, um, you know, there's something a little vague about this shorthand for character, right? Crown prince, princess. Um, I, I think you can dig in with more specificity and not worry so much. Like, is it so important that we know it's a rich neighboring nation or just that this princess's nation has, um, that she, that this marriage comes with humanitarian help, right? So I think there's a little bit of wasted time on details that are critical to understanding the circumstances of this novel, but are not critical to its conflict. I agree, and also um, the vagueness because you want the care you want the reader to be excited about this character in particular, and by either naming them or giving more description up front, that will help the re the reader do that. Because otherwise, it could be any crown prince of any nation, and the reader isn't going to have as much specificity to hang on to. Yeah, so I think this is off to a good start. Certainly there's a lot going on here, but I think zeroing in on, again, character, conflict, stakes, um, I you know I think this, this, as Jen said, makes it seem like too many problems has, have been solved, but a hook should accentuate the problems that will propel the plot forward. Uh, cool, would it be helpful if I share the genre and the title and all that before, or do you prefer to go in cold? Uh, I, don't, I think cold, unless it seems relevant. Yeah, I this I don't know because this one is like a fan, it's, this one's a fantasy, um, but I think for some reason the word humanitarian sort of made me think of like quite a modern setting, and so it kind of threw me when I sort of went. Back it's funny that, that you mentioned that because actually when I was saying it could be a romance, and I couldn't decide if it was supposed to be a fantasy romance or just high fantasy. So I guess in some ways the the genre does matter, but also I feel like um, we we should be able to infer some of that from the hook itself. Um, you know, if it's done right, we should be able to get in there. So let's see how well we guess, and then, and then see, <laughs> see if you need to. Well, I love this friend. an element of of, uh, of of guessing as well as is add a little spice to it. Oh yeah, it's it's how I keep myself interested in these. I mean, <laughs> apart from the great content, uh, Jen, <laughs> really good save. Jen, you want to read this one out? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Lieutenant uh, Cormac McWilliams an ambush in a flower garden where an unknown yet familiar young woman has laid out a picnic and asks him to save her world from goblins. That did not end where I was expecting it to. That was a wild ride from start to finish. We did not, you know, that was not where I thought this was going to go. <laughs> uh, this is a and lot. in some ways this that's a lot. good, I think. Yeah. In um, some ways I, I think, think that is, is good because sorry, I'm I think I'm lagging a little bit. No, that's okay. 
Um, yeah, no, I think it is good to be unexpected, but I also think that this submission spends a lot of time on circumstances and not enough time on this conflict, right? We spend a lot of time just getting through like this huge number of descriptors for, for Cormac McWilliams and, uh, and not enough time getting to the potential portal to another realm or this like introduction of magic happens so late uh, that it seems like some of our focus is misguided. What do you think? Well, I think in some ways I like the misdirection. I think this one has almost the opposite problem from the first one in which where the first one was vague, this one is too specific. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't necessarily, we don't necessarily need to know that he's in the army Corps of engineers. Lieutenant really does a lot of the, the work of sort of telling us that, you know, this guy's military um, and I kind of like that, you know, he sort of, I, ba I basically, I like what this person is going for. I just think it needs tweaking. Yeah. I think I, the like I said, I think, is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess for me, we get a lot of, um, I guess one thing that I, I would notice for this, I would encourage this author to notice that how many words are used to modify Cormac McWilliams and yet are presumed female main character is just shorthanded as young woman. And that to me seems slightly misguided. So uh, again, I think the Lieutenant, Lieutenant does a lot of the heavy lifting around, you know, identifying our main character. Um, yeah, I, I think there's something here. This gives me some um, Nora Roberts awakening vibes. You know, I feel like there's a, <laughs> I feel like there's gonna be some um, like a touch of, vague memories that get clarified over time uh, as we read this one. So, so that's one other thing um, that I want to point out is that uh, those two words finds himself. This is um, it's that that just feels like really passive phrasing to me. And I think that the reason that this sort of lacked conflict, which is one of our one of our three pillars, um, it's because I can find myself doing anything like you want it to be sort of an active either an active choice or like an event that forces him into this situation because otherwise you know i found myself at the bodega this morning buying coffee it, it doesn't it doesn't have the same impact i agree 100 percent. yeah there's there's a bit of, of an agency issue here there's a lack of agency um so again i think interesting concept but maybe an incorrect focus in terms of establishing these these three pillars right complex stakes character Okay, that one's uh, Strategies of Magic by Robert Doucette, uh, a fantasy. Uh, it's one of those, I think I really like that title. Anymore. Yeah, that is, a, that is a good title. Really good title. Uh, okay, the next one uh, is for you, Becca. Uh, here we go. Two burlesque dancers on Bourbon Street in 1949 New Orleans vie to be the headliner on an already crowded stage. Find out what happens when two women want to be the star when one has an axe to grind. Um, <laughs> I think uh, this has a lot of potential, but that second sentence is not doing you any favors. Um, it, you know, the second sentence sounds like a segue on a reality TV show, right? Like, tune in to find out what happens next. And I think uh, instead you could be focusing on humanizing these women who are already shorthanded as burlesque dancers. And then they are further reduced to just two women who want to be the star. So, um, I am apparently harping on female agency in characterization today, but I, I care more about these women than this than these sentences care about these women, and that's for me a problem. Yeah, and I feel like one, you know, even if you don't, you sort of name them or uh, or get specific in that way. That's there's a lot of words in that second sentence, and so you can you can set set up the contrast between them as a way of a giving us more information about the character and B setting up that conflict. Like what is the X? I mean, I grew up in theater and every X sign. Sometimes it's literal. And <laughs> by getting specific about this about, you know, what's the beef, you know, what are they what are they both trying to get? And you can do that in fairly few words. I, I do think that this is being good on um uh like setting. Um, you know, we're we're immediately sort of dropped into a world, which is good. Um and we are aware there is a conflict and, and of what the stakes are. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we know what the stakes are to some degree, but being a headliner, I wonder what comes with that, I guess. Um, you know, just being a star is kind of a self-contained uh, kind of, the, the stakes on that are very self-contained. And, and I always encourage my authors to look outward, to comment somehow on, on how the resolution of the conflict will change either you know, something specific in in their lives as characters or, um, you know, a global impact like saving the world, right? So um, this sort of seems to dead end around the idea of <laughs> occupying a headliner space, bless you. Um, and so I think you could reach a little further outward to the result of that. Um, you know, are they both, you know, struggling? Is there a, a poverty issue? Is there an agency issue? You know, what uh, what is achieved when one is the star? And it can't just be stardom itself is not is not the end, um, yeah. or it shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, you could even set up the. I mean, if, if it's two people fighting, and if, and you know, if you're gonna take if you're gonna take our advice and uh, change that second sentence to sort of provide a contrast between the two, you could use that first sentence to provide a contrast between. You know, for two dancers in Bur Bourbon Street in 1949, it's either become a star or wind up back on the streets or something. Like you could set it yeah. up. You can set up the the duality of it in like from the get go. Yeah, I love that. I think that's great, and I think that that yeah <laughs> that uh, instant takes. Good job. You should do this for a living. Um, <laughs> it's almost like yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, that one was the Axe Woman of Bourbon Street by Jane Delacour. Uh, historical fiction, as you uh, probably guessed. Uh, so, like a literal axe to grind? Maybe she, there's a yeah. literal axe woman. Yeah. So, uh, if you, the axe you're is right. literal, take axe out of the hook. Because I think you want the axe to be a surprise. Like, I, think you want, <laughs> I think the axe needs to be a surprise, in my opinion, if it's in the title. Um, or, Nobody or like, the I. Axe. No one expects the axe or the Spanish Inquisition, but I think um, <laughs> if you go for, like, if you're going to say it, say a literal ax to grind, because obviously ax to grind is just this idiomatic phrase that almost seems like you're relying on a cliche. But if you say a literal ax to grind, that's a that's very different. Um, yeah. So I think, um, you know, if this is a bloodier, you know, deadlier burlesque scene, then maybe uh, we would expect I would find a way to articulate that like as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay. Uh Thank you, Jane. This is our next one from James G. Moore. All right. Um, a case of assault yanks black college student and armchair detective Elliot Thorne out of his comfortable, comfortable world of solving minor campus crimes into his biggest case yet. His growing feelings for the victim complicate his investigation, which soon embroils the entire campus and forces him to risk defying the school's honor code and the victim's desire to move on from the attack. It's too long. It's very long. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's funny because Jen and I were just texting this morning about um, this series that we both really like, uh, the Truly Devious series, which is also like a, um, like a, a, a school campus mystery. And we are both really into it. <laughs> and so the first sentence actually drew me in. There were a lot of words in that, a lot of ideas in that first sentence that, that caught my attention. But then, um, you really kind of proverbially watered down the wine in that second sentence and things went off the rails for me there. Yeah. The other, uh, I also want to point out some, some instances of passive phrasing here that are sort of dragging, making it less hooky. His growing feelings um, complicate his investigation. Like that's, that feels very passive to me. Like something compl you know, I, I don't know if I'm making sense Rebecca, but having that be more active, giving that more agency, like, I, I think that would make that stronger because this is actually, I, I think that this is an interesting concept. It's just being kind of buried under just a lot of stuff. I agree. I think that part of the passivity that we're both responding to is um, the victim has zero agency, right? We've heard that mm -hmm. Elliot has feelings for um, him or her. We, don't them. know. It doesn't matter. But it could be uh, it could be a man or woman. Yeah, <laughs> could be either way. But so Elliot has the feelings, and Elliot is considering disregarding the victim's desire to move on. So these two things together make me really dislike Elliot already, and I liked him a lot in sentence one. So I think um, you know they're growing, like they're 
their feelings for one another and sort of allow the victim to be a participant in this. And I think that that's going to help a ton. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, just, yeah. Well, uh, one thing too is that, you know, you could frame that as part of the conflict, the, you know, the, the desire for justice versus the, the growing feelings, you know, that's, that's one way too to increase conflict. The other thing that I'm feeling is that I am just like, Really, bro? The honor code? Like, what are they going to do? Well, it could be a military. It could be like a military college. I guess um, that's true. But since we haven't heard that, I mean. Yeah. I, well, I and know, I will. Yeah. It, it's it, Those are not high stakes for the average reader violating the honor code. If he's risking expulsion, that is something yeah. different. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, I love this idea, um, Jen, about pitting this. Um, you know, X versus Y is a great way to tease out conflict and stakes. And so growing feelings versus, um, you know, pursuing justice, right? Um, I think that this has great potential, but certainly warrants re-examining uh, how the conflict and stakes are coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, there's some chat in the uh, comments about some confusion as to, you know, everyone is sort of quite confused what, this is classified as everyone's going, this is a blurb. This isn't a hook. But so I think there's still an ongoing confusion with what a hook is. Okay. Can I just, yeah. Jen, you want to clarify? Well, what, what I would like to, to sort of clarify is that the hook brings you into the blurb. We actually have um, examples that we've sort of prepared for, for y'all before. I don't know why I put that in quotes. We did actually prepare them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that we prepared for y'all beforehand, um, where we looked at some of our you know favorite recent reads or, or big books from recent years and pulled the hook out of it. And it's almost always the first line or first few lines of the, the larger blurb. A hook gives you as much information as you can to keep you reading. And then you get sort of deeper into the blurb and, you know, sets up, you know, even more about the conflict and stakes. But the hook should be in should be enough to sort of draw you in. Yeah, I mean the hook, right? If we think about the word itself, you're you're literally snagging your reader with the hook and then you're starting to reel them in with the blurb and then you hope that that first page really like, you know, gets that Is it clear that neither I, of us I don't have, fish. I, 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 was I like, don't neither have of us have fished a day in our lives. Yeah, <laughs> never one time. But I assume that one has to bring the fish into the boat at some point and then maybe take it away <laughs> from where it is and keep it forever. And that's what you want to do with your readers. Yeah. Um, who are not actually dead fish. This one off the rails for me. Uh, but yeah, the and hook I, and blurb are related. They're related and I think that it's not um it's not uh unreasonable for writers to be confused about this because the kinds of work that we're doing here with hooks and blurbs and you know when you start doing your query letter and stuff like that it's very unnatural because you're writing about your own work that you've you know labored for so long to make original and interesting and you're but and we're like make it hooky make it marketable <laughs> you know it's not it's not a, it's not a, a natural muscle for a lot of authors to use so if you're having trouble with it don't feel bad because this is not this is this is a learned skill and it is very hard. <laughs> yeah, but I think the benefit here, of course, is that um, all of these things are interrelated. So once you've really clarified your hook, you are more ready to participate in a Twitter pitch contest. You are more yeah. ready to talk succinctly and clearly about your book. You know, you when you're face to face with agents or other industry professionals, you don't have the chance always to say, well, it, you know, it's it's kind of about X, but it's also about Y, but then there's like a little bit of Z in there. No one cares anymore. You lost your audience. So, um, you know, honing this skill, you know, advocating for your book and your story is a critical part of going from the sort of inward facing process of authorship to the outward facing process of obtaining readership. And so that transition is your responsibility. No one is going to swoop in and do it for you. And so I think um, forcing yourself to think about your book in these terms is is a, an important process of you becoming the best advocate for your work. And whether that means in, you know, writing your entire blurb copy to get Amazon readers hooked or to get, you know, readers hooked from just that little first sentence, um, or whether it means adapting this for a query letter, you you have to get good at this if you want to gain a readership. And I think that that's sort of 
Is there's, a and there's additional chat in the comments where I think everyone's being thrown by the idea of a hook as a sort of structural element in the novel. Being, I'm not. It's like, not in the novel, guys. It's not yeah, in yeah. the novel. It's it's in it's in the marketing materials that you use to talk about the novel. Okay, so I have literally I have no books near me except for a guide to birds of Massachusetts. That's not going to work. <laughs> you have a book. You look on the back to see what it's about. First two sentences, that's your hook. The rest of what you find on the back of the book, that's your blurb. And and that that blurb is often also your Amazon market copy or you know your market copy for wherever you're selling your book. And and here is the you know, the dirty secret that no one will tell you that I'm telling you now, <laughs> and that probably other people have said openly too. Your query, if it's good enough, that will get recycled and turned into the part of the submission letter, which will then in turn get turned into your book copy. The book, the flap copy for Marika Nykamp's number one New York Times bestselling novel, This Is Where It Ends, is like two steps removed from her query letter, which I repurposed and turned into the submission letter. Like, if you know how to talk about your book, it teaches other people how to talk about your book. Very good point. Super, super good point. Um, oh, I thought this was for a query letter. It is, Jennifer. It is, honey. It's for the query letter. It's for your market copy. It's whenever you need to speak, as, like, coherently and quickly about your book, which is any time you are trying to tell anyone about your book, you need to understand your hook. Let's keep looking. And, can, can we and see one focus. of the examples real quick before we go on? Yeah. Just yeah. To kind of... I, my thoughts exactly, yeah. Um, so uh, this is for everybody's new fave series, Bridgerton. Of course, those are based on Julia Quinn's Bridgerton novels, the first of which is called The Duke and I. And this is The Hook. Uh, by all accounts, Simon Bassett is on the verge of proposing to his best friend's sister, the lovely and almost on the shelf Daphne Bridgerton. But the two of them know the truth. It's all an elaborate ruse to keep Simon free from a marriage from marriage minded society mothers. And as for Daphne, surely she will attract some worthy suitors now that it seems a Duke has declared her desirable. So we have characters with actual names, not just shorthanded as Duke and Lady. We have um, the conflict, which is, uh, you know, they're part of this ruse and it's gonna serve, we know how it's gonna serve both of them. And of course we have the stakes which are that, uh, you know, if you know anything about historical fiction, Daphne has to get married and Simon really wants to remain free uh, from the, the, the shackles of marriage. So there Is you it have of, it. And this one's a little bit on the longer side, but I, you know, what we, what we wanted to do in choosing, we chose three examples. Um, two were from romance, but this one's historical. The other one is contemporary. Basically, this tells you all you really need to know about the story, but because I want to know more about the story, I will keep reading the rest of the blurb and then purchase the book, which I totally did after I watched the series like everyone else in America. <laughs> <laughs> like a clown. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I do hope that that is clarifying, but I think we should just keep pressing forward keep because going. I think that yeah. talking around things is less effective. I'm going to encourage everybody watching to worry less about when you are going to use your hook and trust us that you will need it. So just be a sponge and absorb, uh, absorb the information and then just, you know, get yourself a good hook and, and you will find ways to use it. Cool. Uh, here's our next one from uh, Nick uh, Gravaski. Corruption, murder, and forbidden love in Vienna in 1899. Police photographer Leo Katz is a fraud of the dark secret. When his images, images show the murderer of young rebels, he must find the killer to save a woman wrongly accused, but now he risks revealing his true identity and with it his life. A lot going on here. Possibly too much? Too, possibly too much. I mean, nothing about um, the beginning of this, of, of this hook tells us that... Um, Leo is keeping his identity a secret. And so that that last sentence after the semicolon completely threw me. Oh, I guess he's a fraud with a dark secret. So maybe, but it, it's not clear. Like, I think we know his real name. So may, I, that is confusing for me. I don't know. How did you feel, Dan? I, I, I also was a little confused because a dark secret could be anything. It could be hiding his identity it could be that he's a murderer it could be that he's stolen a lot of money and you know has fled to another country like it could be it could, there could 
that could be anything. So I would actually just be clearer, like police photographer Leo Katz is lying about his identity or is, you know, isn't who he says he is, Mm -hmm. you know, setting that up rather than talking around it, then him protecting his identity later has more, has more weight. Yeah, because, I mean, being fraudulent, is he, like, not really, does he not really take the pictures? Like, I'm just, I guess I'm confused about what is fraudulent. Um, I'm I'm intrigued also by why he feels that he has to be the one to find the killer. Uh, oh, police photographer, okay. Um, I, I, is that also a thing? Jen, have you heard of this police photographer? Is that a, yeah. is that a profession yeah. we know? Oh, I, I didn't okay. know that that's well, there's, watch TV. <laughs> there's, you know, in a crime scene, there's always, like, the dude taking the picture. Crime the... scene photographer would have given me a lot yeah. more information. A police photographer makes it sound like maybe he just takes portraits of policemen and posts them, you know, all about. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like a nature photographer, right? Um, yeah. I guess so, crime yeah, scene I photographer think... is more used. Um, I mean, I, I went to, because I don't, they didn't really start calling them crime scenes until, I, I won't go down that that rabbit hole. But, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the terminology here, obviously. Um, but I think I guess the, this idea that he has to be the one to find the killer is still very, is a little vague for me as well, because um, it, I, I think I it has to do with say, his connection to this woman. Well, and also the young rebels is, is adding this other element of confusion in there to me. Like, I mean, when his images show a murderer, like, or like when his I, I, images reveal a murderer, like that would just be clearer. And, you know, then you could get drawn in, to like learn like the political background but like who are the rebels rebelling against like are they you know but well but that's also part of it for me why I was confused about the police photographer bit because um why is he just like out there photographing rebels I don't like is he it almost seems like he's acting like a journalist and then accidentally catches a picture of a murderer I so okay my point being I am confused (laughs) And uh, you do not want me confused with your hook. You want me intrigued. And so I think you have named your character and you, and that's great. And we know his profession kind of, but I am confused about his relationship to the primary conflict and the stakes. And that is where this is failing for me. Yeah. Um, I would also just say, cut that first line because it's a little, yeah. th- that would be, if, if we're talking about the back of a book again, that would be the sort of like, print in you know the one line above it that's like the tagline almost that would be separate yes that's a tagline exactly and it's kind of a vague tagline anyway so just we're going to confuse everyone but don't worry about that just get rid of it um let's all right big giant water bottle break and let's go let's move on martin are you there onward onward martin did we we lose martin oh sorry i'm using I've just been nattering okay. to myself. <laughs> I was like, are we just talking to ourselves? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that was Black Danube by Nick Grabowski, a mystery suspense ooh. thriller. I like that one. Uh, that is a great title. Really uh, good title. Yeah. Black this, Danube. That's really good. This one is uh, Josh Self. Uh, here we go. Colin is the nation's seventh greatest competitive birder by his own estimation and has dedicated his life to the pursuit. I'm in love. When a virus hits the UK and bird watching is outlawed, Colin descends into paranoia and madness. What is a twitcher who cannot twitch? I am obsessed with this. Change nothing. It's perfect. The it only note really I have, perfect. <laughs> the only note I have is that I know what twitching is because I've watched so much Midsummer Murders that I can quote the episodes by heart. But a lot of people in the U.S. aren't really super familiar with calling it twitching. So that might get you, that might get you some resistance. But this is like a great hook. I feel like we have a sense of this character. I feel like we have a sense of the stakes. I don't know. I just love this. What do you think? I love this so much because I am, the pandemic has made me. Yeah, I'm very, well, I'm, it's like, I'm, of course, finding myself in the narrative, but uh, the pandemic has made like a very creepy birder out of me. And for my birthday last month, I got like heavy duty birding binoculars. <laughs> and like, I'm like really going all in on this. And so I love, I love the way you have characterized Colin. I just think we would be pals. Um, I, I think it's great. Please get rid of the comma after UK and I and again, so the the words Twitcher and Twitch 
are going to alienate some readers. So I would maybe consider a more global version of this that uses a different word. But I, I think it's great. If you had to guess what the title of this book is. The Twitcher? The twi yeah, yeah. The Twitcher? <laughs> <laughs> I don't love the title. It but, uh, sounds like yeah. it's a Witcher parody. Oh, like, that's what you're going to get. For sure does. That is, that is absolutely what it... Um, Toss a coin yeah. to your Twitch. <laughs> Sorry. I've been it doesn't inside for seem... a very long time. <laughs> this doesn't... I, the, the title doesn't capture the quirkiness that the hook uh, delivers. And and this is this is major uh, quirkiness. And I love it. Well, and, so. and what I also love about this is that, you know, we're, we're sort of getting quirkiness and we're getting humor, but paranoia and madness is also pointing to a very interesting direction for this story so i i feel like it doesn't um you know it's sort of it's doing that thing where it's dangling more information and i'm like what paranoia what madness what's he gonna do so this is um, uh, yeah. a, wor a work of literary fiction avi we we, yeah, we totally got that yeah i think we we all we all determined this Perfect. uh yeah we love this Cool. Uh, thank you, Josh, for sending that one in. Here's our next one. Harry Hargreaves, a young actor touring Saskatchewan with a children's theater company, is recruited to work as an intelligence agent for the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service. Halfway there. Halfway. Yeah. <laughs> so you just need another sentence. So you've established, <laughs> yeah, this is Saskatchewan. So you have your, um, you've done a great job defining your character. And the circumstances, right? Which is that he's been recruited to work as an intelligence agent. But circumstances are different from conflict. A conflict um, is, is something that stands between Harry and his desire. And so I, where, where I'm unclear is, is why he has been recruited and for what specific purpose. And so while this is very interesting to me um, that he's this you know, actor turned spy, I don't know why we're going to care about it yet. And to get me to care, you have to tell me what's going on. What is he spying about and why that is important to, you know, the ongoing health and well-being of Saskatchewan. And one thing, um, two things I want to point out. Um, I think you can cut intelligence agent um, because that means you're repeating intelligence within the space of like six words. And also, um, I want to contrast the kinds of questions that Rebecca is asking with the kinds of questions we had about the previous one. You want people to have questions because they're excited, and you don't want them to have questions because they require answers to those questions to get excited, if that makes sense. Very good distinction. Really, yes, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I feel really clear about this now. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think one more line, um, and and you know, going back to one of our earlier examples, you could set up a conflict between you know, hit, you know, being an actor, you know, the duties of being an actor and like putting on animal costumes and performing for children, and you know, what he whatever he has to do for, you know, the 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 C S I S. I also just wonder, like, is this, like, the last entry that we had, our, the Twitcher, um, there was a kind of, there was a sort of quirky, almost tongue-in-cheek awareness of absurdity, and I wonder how, like, why has this actor touring with a children's theater company, why is that important to his work with uh, the Security and Intelligence Service? And I wonder if there's actually something funny or quirky here that's just not getting in. And I also wonder if instead of adding something at the end, you put something in the middle, like, is, you know, is, is he a natural fit for this job because there's been like a string of terrorist incidents that they think is connected to like the world of children's theater? Like, you know, that it's putting, a racket. putting it, putting that sort of in the middle would then lead into being recruited. That sort of sets up, that sort of sets up the conflict without you having to give too much more detail and make it too long, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's that conflict and stakes piece. Um, again, this is character and circumstance, but we need character conflict stakes. Great. Uh, that was Douglas E. Hughes's The Poor Player, uh, mystery suspense or thriller. Uh, okay, here is our next one from Lemon Sinclair. London, 1760. 
After her arrest for the murder of her husband, a skilled and mysterious apothecary forges an unlikely alliance with an enlightened privy counselor and a pioneering blind magistrate to solve medical and other mysteries. I think this is a pretty good start. Um, I don't love the word mysterious um, because mystery, like if she's our point of view character, if she's our main character, she's not mysterious to herself. So that, so secretive might be better. Um, also, this isn't really a conflict, you know, is, is she solving these crimes so that she doesn't get arrested so that she doesn't go to jail? Yeah, that's confusing. Um, I, yeah, I, I think the problem for this is that it gestures to a series of ongoing um, monster of the week conflicts instead of telling me about the big bad, right? So this almost feels like the setup for um, like a, a Holmesian, Sherlockian kind of, uh, we're, the three of us are going to tackle various mysteries. And together they next crime. time. Yes, exactly. So I, I kind of need to know um, more specifically what the, are, are they trying to find the real murderer? Is Did she actually murder her husband? Um, it, it's not clear at all if she's guilty. Uh, so perhaps if the primary arc of this novel involves um, bringing the true killer to justice, I think you should mention that. Um, I am also a little bit confused about who the main character is and whether this is... Um, you, you've given a shorthand for everybody, right? A skilled and mysterious apothecary, nameless. Enlightened privy counselor, again, nameless. And pioneering blind magistrate, specific, but also nameless. So I, I'm just unclear on whether she leads them or they all have sort of equal narrative privilege. So these are, again, interesting circumstances and interesting characters, but not enough specificity to drive my interest. This what one she here. said. This one here reminds me <laughs> of another one you submitted, the V.E. Schwab one. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah let's should we... Throw it up there. Yeah. Jen? Would you France, 1714. In a moment of desperation, a young woman makes a Faustian bargain to live forever and is cursed to be forgotten by everyone she meets. Uh, this is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. Um... And yeah, so what about this? What about that one, uh, Martin? Reminded you of this example, just out of curiosity. Sorry, come again. I said, what about that previous example made you think of this? Oh, because it started with location, date. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is effective, right? Like it, it is a, certainly a way to sort of get that out of, get that out in the open. Yeah. And I think, um, can we go back to the other one real quick? Uh, give me a second. I have to paste it back in. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Making you work hard today. Uh, oh, here we are. Oop. Pasty, pasty. Here we go. So one thing um, that, uh, you, you know, the, you know we, we talked a little bit about earlier, which is, which is the sort of the passive langu language thing. Um, forges an unlikely alliance um, to solve medical and other mysteries. That could be, I mean, that could be any, any, you know, ragged band of misfits story. So what is it about this partnership? What is it about these mysteries? Is it, you know, an ongoing spate of crimes that look just like the murder of her husband's? Like, what is it specifically about this story that is interesting? And yeah bring that to the fore. Yeah, I would turn the dial way up on the specificity and um, and and I think the character too. I'm just not sure where I'm supposed to be looking. It feels a little bit like that scarecrow, this thing, you know? I'm just not sure what you want me to see here. You could even lose, I mean, I, I would even say, especially because I'm a dum-dum from America, I'm not entirely sure what a privy counselor is. So I you have no lose. idea. <laughs> Truly, I, truly, I, I know just what a magistrate just, is. I, I assumed everybody else lawyer. knew, and it was just me that didn't know. No, Wait, no what idea. is it, Martin? I think it is. I think it's a lawyer because you have the privy council. Uh, as someone who you have, have the privy council, we do not have the privy council. 
Uh, yeah, they, uh, there is yeah. a privy council. We barely uh, have a functioning government at this point. But, but very, what, I, very what I mean is that you could say, you could lose all those words from enlightened privy councilor down to magistrate and say a skilled and like a skilled and secretive apothecary forges an, an alliance with her captors, which is much more interesting to Ooh. something, 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 you know? Yeah. Oh, that's good. You should, someone should write that. I mean, if this isn't that, someone should write that. Um, yeah. Well, they I agree. Captors. I just, you know, she's been arrested. She's in jail. <laughs> yeah. But like, but we're not actually told, I mean, maybe they're in jail too. Maybe they are also mysterious. I, we have no idea. Um, yeah, I just think, yeah, we need to know the relationships among these uh, characters and who's in charge and what, what they're doing. I love the idea that there are some lookalike murders. Add that in. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Like, it wasn't me, I was in jail. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Okay, cool. Here is uh, from L. Roman. Um, am I reading this one? I've lost track of time. Yeah, you okay. I think it's you. Okay, uh, Gigi's parents' July 4th car crash leaves love-struck lifeguard Ryan two choices. My brain is already stuttering over the logistics of this. Help her navigate the aftermath and be heartbroken once Gigi leaves his New Jersey island at summer's end or suffer right away while his rival steps up. Okay, y'all. Um, there, There is a lot of logistical, cyclical... If busyness. there's more than one possessive in the first sentence, people's brains time to are rephrase. Going to break. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when Gigi's parents are killed in a car crash, way but I wouldn't even save information. I would start with Ryan. Love struck yeah. lifeguard Ryan has two choices. Help his summer, uh, help Gigi, his new summer love, navigate the aftermath of her parents' uh, car crash and be heartbroken once she leaves uh, for the mainland or, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, like, I also have big time problems with this idea that the, that the major issue that we're confronting in this book is which, which person gets to battle for Gigi's affection. Like, is this really the biggest problem Ryan has? Well, I think, too, that, um, I mean, I, I don't mind it, because if it's a romance, like, it, you know, that's, that's, that's the conflict. But No, it's also... not. But if it's a romance, the conflict is whether or not they can be together. The conflict is, is not whether or not he pursues her. He has to pursue her if this is a romance. So, you know, I think that we're, we're, we're getting a lot about the circumstances in the inciting action. You're telling me how this book starts, but I don't actually know what the conflict is. And if, if the issue is whether or not they can stay together long distance after the summer ends, like, okay, I guess, but, but none of that is here. Um, you know, I, it also seems very strange and a little tone deaf to be like, well, she has dead parents, but he's love struck. You know, I just <laughs> feel like there's like a little bit of a disconnect here between, um, like, like what Ryan, maybe this happening. isn't about you. Yeah, like Ryan and like read the room. But also is is the July 4th car crash because someone, some like, you know, kids were drinking and driving and now Ryan has to help her figure out who killed her parents, but that will actually just, bring his world to its knees. I, I think we're too in the crime, too in the crime <laughs> vein for that. It's it's probably not that. But I think too that you you know, the way that this is set up makes me think that, you know, maybe he you know, is this a situation where he sort of swore to never get involved with a summer girl, you know, like, Ooh, is, like you know, that. because, because of that, because if that's something that he always promised himself, because, you know, for whatever reason, then, then actually the choice to pursue her has a lot more impact because he's breaking a promise that he made to himself. And yeah. Yeah. It just honestly seems like we're burying the lead. Uh, with, you know, starting with a car crash and then de-escalating to Ryan's hurt feelings. It, it's, there's like a little bit of a, you're, you're starting with a literal impact and then being like, but Ryan and his heart. So I feel like you have to dramatize Ryan and his heart um, and maybe make more of this car accident or this idea that, or, you know, he's sworn off summer girls. Or the rival, like... You know, is the rival someone that has genuinely wronged him? Like, is he just the real sack of shit, or is he like a general, like a genuine good option for Gigi? I'm, also, I don't love the name, of, but that's like 
my own thing. Yeah. I watched that movie at a way too formative age, and that's I recognize that that is my my beef. That's your baggage. Yeah, I just I, I think look, I think the truth for me is that I would have more global issues with the execution of this story, which doesn't which I think is coming from a gaze that makes me a little uncomfortable. I'm just not, I'm not into wh what this suggests about the book writ large, um, which again is, is not the point of this particular broadcast. So I'm going to move on from that. But I, I think if, if I'm wrong and this isn't about Ryan being precious, then you have led me astray with this hook, which makes him seem like an absolute, I won't use a bad word, now, but it just doesn't make me like him very much. <laughs> Am I not supposed um, to swear? Was I not supposed yeah, to swear? Yeah, it's oh, I don't know. <laughs> there, might be some, there might be some younger people here. So, uh, right, I'll that PG, PG 13 rating on this one. Yeah. Um, right. Well, let's let's go to the next one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a uh, uh, Roman Lost at the End, the commercial fiction uh, for young adults. Um, okay. I like that title. Here is one that's sort of uh, along the sort of YA vein as well. Uh, it's a lot a lot of detail, but this is it. You get all the long ones, Jen. You go for it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> On the morning of his 14th birthday, uh, Galileo Hunter become, became the latest of his line to take custody of the rarest of hand-me-downs, an ornate telescope crafted centuries earlier by the father of astronomy himself, Galileo Galilei. And in that moment, the young Galileo unknowingly catalyzed the lethal attention of the Institute, the most dangerous underground organization on the planet. I would not give a priceless artifact to a 14 year old because they are agents of destruction, but setting that aside, um, <laughs> it's too long and we don't get enough information about the, the conflict of the stakes. Yeah, I, honestly, this first sentence can be completely summarized by um, when, when Galileo uh, takes custody of his namesakes uh, by a, a, a rare telescope handcrafted by his namesake, comma, he unknowingly catalyzes the lethal attention of the Institute, the most dangerous underground organization on the planet. I also don't love catalyze, catalyzes. It's, it's just, why well, say catalyze when you can say draws? Um, yes, it's a little uh, thesaurus happy. That's true. Um, it, I just think that it's very busy. And I think you're spending so much language focused on this artifact and not enough on the stakes here, like who cares that he has the Institute's attention? Maybe they want to send him to college. We have no idea. Um, a you know, a the shadowy lethal... cabal can pay for my student loans. It's fine with me. <laughs> Any Just... old time. Yeah, lethal attention, like in what way? Is it because they want this, um, this ornate telescope? And if so, again, why are we giving it to a child? Lots of questions, not enough answers. I think that is, um, you know, get to the, get to the stakes, get to the real conflict. You're giving us a lot of circumstance. We know who the players are, but we don't know the game. Uh, okay, just going to try to get through a couple of more before the end. Someone has asked, uh, where do we choose this? Why isn't there a, a wider range? These are a uh, fairly wide range, but I find like uh, when picking them that the historical fiction ones and some of the mystery ones had enough for us to talk about. A lot of the science fiction ones we had were basically, it would be pretty indecipherable. We'd have to make a lot of guesses about what they were. And it, was a, it wouldn't have been suitable to, to share. Uh, but thank you for sending all of them in. Of course, there were like 600 entries sent in. But of course, uh, I'm afraid we can't get to everybody's one. Uh, however, here oh. is uh, the pretty much one of the only science fiction ones that I can make heads or tails of. Two down-and-out grave robbers are thrown into a world of classic horror monsters, giant automatons, and an army of reanimated corpses as they, strive, as they try to survive the mad undertakings of a megalomaniac, none other than Victor Frankenstein. Okay. Um, it shouldn't be a semi... Is that... That's the wrong pu punctuation point in the rant. In yes, the last. very, very incorrect. Um, yeah. None other than Victor Frankenstein is a fragment and therefore cannot appear after a semicolon unless it is an item in sequence. And so you can use um, an M dash a or a colon. colon here. Yeah, M yeah. dash or colon, depending on the vibe. Um, down and out is a, 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 an adjective that needs to be hyphenated. Um, you know, down and out gray robbers. We, we promised not to focus on grammar, but we couldn't help it. Um, <laughs> it was just so distracting, I couldn't help myself. Um, you know, there's so much, I don't know how you feel about this, Jeb, but I feel like there's a lot of time defining the adversaries, right? The monsters, the automatons, the reanimated corpses, 
uh, and but but there's not enough. I mean, I don't really care whether or not the grave robbers survive, and I don't know why they've been drawn into this world, really. For this it, yeah, and also um, it, it may seem like survival in an, in and of itself is sort of conflict enough, but it's survival for what? Um, is it survival and riches? Is it survival and family? Is it survival and peace? Like there has to be something that is sort of driving these guys to get through this. And, you know, in the way that um, uh, we were wondering why the apothecary was sort of pursuing this, you know, pursuing these crimes. Is it for justice? Is it for survival? Like there's always got to be something. So here we're kind of missing that something. We just have a lot of pizzazz. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, just like modified nouns here, right? There's just a lot of, uh, you've populated this, these, this sentence with a lot of figures, but I don't know how they all relate to each other necessarily. Um, and I think if Frankenstein, if Dr. Frankenstein is the villain, give him that centrality as the primary antagonist. We're so distracted by what one assumes are his minions, right? These monsters, et cetera, uh, that I don't really understand why. I mean, I can see why Grave Robbers and Dr. Frankenstein would be in conflict because they're like competing for the same resources. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but like, I don't, I just, I don't know where it goes from there. It kind of seems like they would be on like team body parts together. So like, what yeah. do the grave robbers want with the body part with like these bodies and why do they want to keep, I just, so many questions. Also so like I, logistically, yeah. is the world that they're thrown into a literal world? Is it just, is it a, is this a portal to a frame where Frankenstein is not fictional and in fact real and that therefore all these things can happen? Like that's another question that's going to come up for readers and some people just don't really love portal fantasy. So if that's actually a thing, then they're going to want to know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. There, there's just a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I, I mean, so many questions. So I think, again, we, we, we want to have questions about wanting more content, not about the nature of the content itself. Yeah. Cool. Uh, that one's The Resurrectionist by Clem Arnold, uh, science fiction. Uh, okay, like we have title. one last one. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have just one last one, uh, and... Uh, it's sort of a, a mix of the two genres that uh, we've been hitting up quite often, uh, but I think it's an interesting one. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Dan. You do the honors. Sherlock Holmes uh, slash Elizabeth Bennet. Um, when she is framed for her fair friend's murder, uh, plain Jane Poppy must oh. prove her innocence and restore her reputation. In a Georgian-era society where murderers have no manners, Poppy must abandon her ladylike ways to catch a killer. Actually, I don't, I, I don't hate this. I, I, I like this. Fun. I mean, I think it is super fun. Certainly, um, Sherlock Holmes meets Elizabeth Bennet doesn't really belong in your hook. Yeah, this feels like it was maybe taken from a Twitter pitch contest or something. Absolutely. Um, I also, yeah. I would also say that um, uh, not like I feel like there's one more element that I want, and it, I think maybe it stakes. I know we have prove our prove her innocence here, but I feel like there's like, like does she care about her reputation? Like, I don't know. I feel like there's one more thing that I want, but I don't. I don't know what, it, what it is. Yeah, I, I, I guess I think it's for me. I think it's um, part of the this inciting incident framed for her fair friend's murder. There's also a big focus on the appearance. Does it matter that her friend is fair and she is plain Jane? I am very confused about that. Um, I, also, I, I would just say accused because there's a lot of awkward alliteration happening and framed for her fair friend's murder is it's a lot, a little much. It's a lot. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I mean, I love, I love this idea of a of a Georgian, you know, of a Sherlockian and Elizabeth Bennet. That's very attractive to me. Um, and I, I like the way you've played with this. Murderers have no matter manners. Um, I, I think that's quite catchy. Uh, mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, you're right. There is, there's something missing. I kind of feel like there are, she all, must have a sidekick somewhere, right? Does she, is she intrepid and alone or does she have, does, I don't know, there's something about the relationship between 
uh, her status in society and her solving the murder maybe? Yeah, I also, I mean, this is like the most pedantic quibble. Elizabeth Bennett was the second most beautiful Bennett daughter, so she wasn't a plain Jane. So if we're gonna do that, we get she's the Mary Bennett. True. <laughs> she's Mary Very Bennett, true. or she's or she's oh, well, Charlotte I, Lucas. Like <laughs> I, I would take out like take out the. Oh, sorry, Becca. You uh, if you hear this, you have stopped just before you said I would take out. <laughs> I was like, I thought it was just me. It's like, what happened? Oh no. <laughs> Uh, but I, if she was about to say take out the first the Sherlock Holmes slash Elizabeth Bennett, I would agree. Um, yeah. Because uh, I think too that oh you froze for a oh, minute. Uh, You're back. You're back. I'm back. Um, what I was about to say is um, like take out all these references to their. Oh, I'm, am I frozen again? No, I'm not. Okay. No, you're back. I keep freezing. Um, because I like just sway here. Uh, yeah. So I would take out these references to their appearance. I just think that doesn't matter and i would be concerned if it did matter i guess i mean something that something that would you know that would actually be like a better way to contrast the two instead of saying like her fair friend like her like like vivacious friend and instead of plain jane say like wallflower because i feel like it sort of can it it also gives us a little bit more idea of her personality because you can be plain or beautiful and you can have a personality that's just like a box of rocks so giving Wait, us more Jen, are you saying and Jen, are you saying that women can have depth and personality that has nothing to do with their appearance? What? Wait, what? <laughs> wait. Okay, that was just whoosh. all right. Um, yeah, certainly, um, certainly, I don't, I don't care about that. And I think um, maybe if you could even articulate, I, I think that what Jen is saying also articulates more about like if her friend is um, sort of the gem of the ton, and she is a wallflower. That definitely brings the setting alive more and establishes a little bit more of that Georgian era um like juiciness well, and it also that we all love gives and it also gives more conflict because it's a journey from her being a wallflower to abandoning her ladylike ways to catch a killer so it suggests a journey and it su suggests a conflict and stakes for her in a way that wasn't there before yeah i, I yeah i think that that is we fixed i think it. the we fixed it. We've, it. Like I'm still, I am really interested in this, and I love this idea very a, a lot. I mean, this appeals to me in a lot of ways. I think we're nitpicking because the concept seems really strong, and the hook isn't isn't. Um, it just doesn't go from strength to strength the way I would like it to, uh, because this just seems very cool. And so I think uh, by refining it, you will sort of <laughs> we're hanging all of our hopes on you. Uh, but it, it definitely <laughs> seems like this could be so much more uh, than what it is. That's what that's what happens when you like something is like, all right, let me tear this apart to make it better. <laughs> I want to make it stronger. Yes. Cool. Uh, well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, uh, that was great. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't get to as many as we'd hoped for, but with something like this, uh, the purpose of this is hopefully to, you know, by watching editors and agents talk through what they see in, in a hook, you'll be able to see how they view it and perhaps uh, uh, f factor that into uh, how you write yours. Uh, both of you, uh, of course, are editors here on Reedsy. Uh, Jen, uh, is there anything in particular you are looking for in terms of projects right now? I'm really excited about um, all kinds of fiction. I actually haven't gotten many mysteries, and I, I love mysteries. So if, 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 there, if anyone's got one that they want uh, editorial assessments or developmental editing uh, done on, I would be delighted to look at those. Cool. And... Uh, Becca, anything new? Uh, you're still looking for the same old, same old? Uh, you know me. I like to have a little peek at, at anything. Uh, one never knows what will um, really grab my interest. Uh, I want to say two things, logistics things. Number one, uh, we love to hear from you. Jen and I would love to see you uh, on our socials, but please don't message us with your hook asking us for some private feedback because we do not have time. Um, and the second thing, I'm just going to head you all off there. Uh, and then the second thing I want to say is that I, I do want to hear from, from you if you think you have a project that I would like, but I am currently booking September 2021. So if you have something that needs attention in the next like four days, I can't help. Uh, so that <laughs> happens a lot as well. People are like, can you do it tomorrow? It's only 95,000 words. So uh, for me, that's a that's a no. But um, thank you so much for, for coming, for being here. We, we love to have you. Cool. Uh, and uh, check out... Uh... 
uh, blog.readsy.com slash live. Our next Readsy Live in two weeks' time is on picture books. Uh, we have an editor who's uh, one of our best uh, and most popular ch uh, children's book editors who worked on the Hunger Games, uh, but she'll be talking about picture books. Uh, uh, and it should be a good one. If you're thinking of getting into that game, uh, definitely uh, tune in for that. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, cheers, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.